I was in the Hebrew Roots Movement, and I believed wholeheartedly in keeping the Sabbath, keeping the dietary laws, following the feasts of the Old Covenant. I believed that everything that applied to the Abrahamic Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, applied to me as a New Testament believer. People that are misinformed, many times they think that they're serving God by keeping a feast they're not actually keeping. The Passover, for example, they had to sacrifice a lamb. And one of the requirements for first fruits is that you bring a sheave offering to the priests, and the priests will then wave it before the Lord. If you're claiming to keep first fruits and you're not fulfilling that commandment, that requirement, then you're coming up with your own invention of the feasts. You're taking away from God's commandments and therefore disobeying them. So if someone says, I'm keeping Passover, but they're not offering a lamb, they're actually lying. And unfortunately, they're taking away from God's word. They're coming up with their own feast, their own man-made traditions. They are cherry picking certain parts of Leviticus 23 while pretending that the rest were fulfilled. Look, it's either all or none. Either Jesus fulfilled these feasts and the requirements, or he didn't and we're still going to offer animal sacrifices. And in Hebrews 9, it mentions how the feasts no longer apply. It says, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. All of these different Hebrew roots assemblies, they're all on different calendars half the time. They don't even know what day to celebrate whatever feast they're trying to celebrate. But God is very clear. He says there is a specific time where you observe these feasts. The Hebrew Roots Movement can't even agree on it. They don't even know. They're taking a best guess. They get all sorts of confusion about which calendar to use because they're not actually following the Word of God. They're following just what they think is historically accurate, but it is historically inaccurate. It's just made up. And in the New Testament, Jesus is our High Priest. But when you say that name, the name of Jesus, to a Hebrew Roots believer, they will turn around and say, well, did you know that the name of Jesus is pagan, or they'll say the name of Jesus is inferior to the name of Yeshua, and they'll try to say that Yeshua was the original name of the Messiah. But what they're basing that on is modern Hebrew. Now, modern Hebrew wasn't even invented till the 1800s. Hebrew was a dead language for over a thousand years. Nobody spoke it. So you're going to tell me that for a thousand years after the death of Christ, nobody knew his name? That's a lie. The name of the Messiah was very much available to people even during the time where Hebrew was a dead language. They were still able to speak the name of Jesus. In Greek, the original name in the New Testament is Jesus, Jesus. My wife is Romanian. She says that it's translated in their language, Isus. His name is Jesus. The word Yeshua is simply a translation of the name of Jesus into a language that was invented in the 1800s. And then people turn around and call that the original. And this is why the Hebrew Roots Movement, again, they're so divided on all of this as well because they think that the name of Jesus could have been Yahashua. And some will say, oh, his original name was Yeshu. Or some will say that his name was Yeshua. They don't even know what his name is. They're just all asserting that the name of Jesus is inferior. And that should be a red flag considering the entire world disavows of the name of Jesus. They use it as a cuss word. Do you see people using Yeshu's name or Yahashua's name as a cuss word or as a swear word? The only name that you hear people taking in vain is the name that's above every name. And if the Hebrew language was truly the words of the Lord, this pure language, then it would not have been dead for over a thousand years. Many in the Hebrew roots teach that if you're not circumcised, that you can't be saved. Circumcision was actually part of the Abrahamic covenant. The Bible says, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision wasn't even given until Abraham came along, and the Sabbath wasn't even made known to the children of Israel until Mount Sinai, until these covenants came into place. And so, yes, the moral laws of God are unchanging, but the laws and ordinances within specific covenants for specific people, those are subject to change. They'll say, well, see, we're supposed to be circumcised. Well, wait a second. Circumcision wasn't given until Abraham came into existence. 
that means that circumcision was not part of the eternal law of God, the eternal moral justice of our Lord, that it was something that was given as part of a covenant. That's why the Bible says, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. People within the Hebrew roots teach that it's an abomination to eat pork, and they take Leviticus out of context and they make it out as if that specific part of that covenant applied to us, when really kosher laws were simply a picture. And the reason that I say that is because before the kosher laws were implemented, the Lord actually told Noah when he got off the ark that every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Now, if there was unclean and clean animals, why would it say that every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you? You know what the Lord was saying to Noah? that he could have pork, that he could have a ham sandwich if he wanted to, that it's not that which goes into a man that defiles him. And the Bible doesn't just say this in Noah's time. It also says in the New Testament, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. And so the kosher laws were just like the other ordinances and they were very symbolic and ceremonial in nature. And so they weren't part of God's eternal law. This is part of a specific covenant that we're talking about. And so people in the Hebrew Roots movement, what they do when they try to sell the Hebrew Roots theology to others is they'll say, well, did you know God's law is the truth? The Bible says that it's the truth and we should follow all of God's commandments. But the fact of the matter is that they're mixing up ordinances that were given for a time under specific covenants with God's eternal moral law. They're picking and choosing, they're cherry picking. Because if the Mosaic law never changed, then sacrifices would still be required. Apparently something changed. And so once you can get them to admit that sacrifices are no longer required, which they'll pretty quickly admit oftentimes, you can then use that to show them that everything associated with the Mosaic covenant with regards to animal sacrifices and feasts and kosher and those sorts of things were done away in Christ. They no longer apply in this covenant that we live in. And many will say, well, I've still got to wear tzitzits. I got to wear these little strings on my side to remind me of God's commandments. Well, let me tell you, if you're walking in the spirit, you don't have to have external commandment reminders all over yourself. The Bible tells us that in the new covenant, that the law of God would be put into our hearts and that the more that we walk in the spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. God's law is a very spiritual thing. Yes, it's based in the Bible, but we don't have to wear shawls and tzitzits and to fill in and wrap ourselves up in this stuff. It's going specifically against what the New Testament says. The New Testament, the new covenant, it was prophesied that God would not only remember our iniquities no more, because Jesus died on the cross, but it also says that God's laws would be written upon our hearts. We no longer have to be told to go to a priest and have him go intercede for us before God behind the veil of the temple. When Jesus died, it was torn asunder because Jesus is our high priest. The Bible says having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, it says that the law of commandments was not done away. It was the law of commandments that were contained in ordinances that were abolished. Things such as the feasts, kosher laws, and anything that did not apply eternally. When it comes to being saved, the Hebrew Roots Movement is very confused about this as well because they teach many times that you have to be a good person, stay on the path, follow the Torah, and to get people into the movement, Many times they will say not to use the name Yeshua around these Christians, but to lure them in by using the name of Jesus first. They can't use the name Yeshua because there's no real power in it because it's a counterfeit because it wasn't invented until the 1800s and they don't even know how to pronounce it. It is such a cult tactic and they won't give you all the knowledge until you've been brought in and then they can start indoctrinating you with it. And this is why the Hebrew Roots Movement meets all of the criteria for being a modern day cult. And when they come to you and say that you've got to keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath is another ordinance that was fulfilled by Jesus. Think about it. They were killed in the Old Testament for not observing the Sabbath. If somebody was caught working in the camp when they're supposed to be resting, they were killed. The Sabbath is a picture of the fact that if you're working your way to heaven 
when you're supposed to be resting in the finished work at Calvary, your soul will be destroyed. Your soul will suffer eternal torment. The Bible is very clear on this, that if you're not resting in Christ, which is what the Sabbath was a picture of, that your soul will face the second death. And this is why the Bible tells us in Colossians, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. People shouldn't be allowed to judge us and say, well, why aren't you keeping the Sabbath? Why aren't you keeping these feast days? We can't even keep the feast days anymore because the requirements within the feasts were that animal sacrifices were to be given. And if you're not fulfilling those requirements, then you're not keeping the feasts. You're lying about keeping them. You're pretending to keep them. You're keeping your own made up version of the feasts. You're not even observing that which was the original. You're just observing something that you came up with on your own, that you invented out of thin air. That's why you go to these Hebrew Roots feasts, and many times it's a rock concert. It's, they don't even believe in what the historic feasts of the Lord were all about. There is nothing but confusion in the Hebrew Roots movement. It's all a lie. I was in it. And I can tell you firsthand that it was a cult, it was a false religion, and it's just like every other false religion. Because the proponents of Hebrew Roots believe that we're not actually born again. They will teach, most of them anyways, that salvation's a process, and that you're not judged until the very end of your life. That you have to keep on enduring and keep your own salvation. Well, thankfully, Jesus has kept my salvation since the day I got saved. And he can do that for you too. If you've been deceived, and if you're in this movement, you need to escape it. In the Hebrew roots, many of them refuse to use the name of Jesus, but then they'll turn around and completely disagree on what's supposedly the original, and they don't even know how to pronounce it, they don't even know what it was spelled like. And in the sacred names movement, they actually teach that you have to deny the name of Jesus, you have to denounce it to be saved. That is satanic. That's why the Hebrew roots movement is a very pagan false religion. Jesus is false. It's a false name. They know it. Okay, it was created. The entire Christian world calls the Messiah by a completely bogus and made up false name. And I want you to get this. They know it. It should be painfully obvious that the Christian preachers care nothing really about the facts. It takes a circumcised heart along with the flesh. Uh, no one will enter the kingdom unless they are circumcised of heart and of flesh. Yeshua, our Savior, did not do away with the, um, the, the, the holy days of Yahweh. Yahweh, through His Son, can make you live again. And He will do exactly that at a resurrection for those He finds worthy of everlasting life. You either remain faithful and rise in that first blessed resurrection, or you'll be judged in the second resurrection, which carries the penalty of everlasting death. They're teaching what Muslims believe. They're teaching what Mormons believe. They're teaching the same thing Jehovah's Witnesses will say, that you can lose your salvation. And that's a very pagan false doctrine. That's why Jesus said in John 3, that if you're born of the Spirit, you're in God's family. And you are born again if you've trusted in Christ.